Hello! So, Carinado have released the Piper Archer 2, the PA28 for Microsoft Flight Simulator. I've just downloaded and installed it, so I thought we might go and have a look at it. So let's have a look at it outside. As is common now with all of the Carinado aircraft, it's absolutely wonderfully modelled. So, you know, it almost looks like a photograph when you pan around it. It's quite spooky, actually. Yeah, it's their skills with modelling the aircraft are just getting better and better and better. Okay, if we go inside, it's a similar story inside. It looks like a photograph, it looks real. Obviously, this is an aircraft of a certain age, so it looks quite worn. And that's, I guess that's not, shouldn't be surprised about that. And you will notice because it is an aircraft of a certain age, then there are certain creature comforts that you're not going to find in this aircraft. Like there's no autopilot, for example. So we will work through getting this started up. But before we do that, let's just have a look in the tablet, which is common to most of the Carinado aircraft. We can turn some static elements on outside, and as you can see, that's put a cover over the aircraft, which is quite cool, and some covers over the pitot tubes and things like that. So if we come back in, turn that back off, we can go and put the external power in and the tow bar, for example. So there we go, there's the tow bar and the external power. It looks like a common asset that you get with lots of the Carinado aircraft, to be honest. So we'll turn this back off just to, um, to help. You can hide or show the pilot and co-pilot from the outside view. We'll just leave them as they are. You can open the passenger door. You can either do it with the tablet or you can use the controls within the cockpit. So you can click on the various levers, latches then, to open the door and close it. So we can pull it back to and we can lock the latches again. He says famous last words. There we go. I'm not overly familiar with where the various click spots are yet. There's a cargo door as well outside and you can remove the fairings. So this is fixed undercarriage aircraft and there are some fairings around the wheels. We'll leave them on. Okay, so if we go to the next page, if you do have the GTN 750, you can enable it. I have removed it from my flight simulator at the moment because it was just causing too much trouble. Okay, so then we can go next. And there's some shortcuts to start the aircraft up to get it ready for flight. So if you're not interested in procedural stuff, then you can take it straight, you know, for running ready to fly. Um, there's a takeoff checklist. There's a landing checklist. And that's pretty much it. So if we go and put the tablet away, I've noticed the click spot for closing the tablet isn't always very responsive. But I say I, I have noticed I've only loaded this a few minutes ago so I had a quick look around to find out where the switches were I've not actually flown it yet so if there's a disaster on the runway then you're going to see it okay how do we get this thing started then so if we remove the yoke so we can see what's going on we're going to need to move the mixture to rich we said earlier that the fuel shut off is already on the left tank so that's good turn the battery on Turn the alternator on, turn the anti-collision lights on. So if we go and look outside, we should see the collision light there is flashing away, which is great. And we should be able to turn the engine over now. So let's go and try it. It's debatable whether we'll need a fuel pump. It's a nice warm day, so we should be fine. So we turn the magnetos around to both and then to start. And it roars into life. So it did that with the engine on idle. So in common with lots of the Carinado aircraft, the engine modeling isn't tremendously realistic. So you can't overheat the engine as such, and you can't really um, do any damage during startup. If we have a look outside, we'll sit on the parking brake and run the engine up. Very good. Okay, so we can now go and turn on the avionics and turn on the landing lights and the... Oh, we don't need the fuel pump. That was a, a mistake. Uh, turn on the pita heat. So we're waiting for things to come online. We're going to turn the transponder on. ADF is over here. So it's worth having a look at the instruments. We get a clock, airspeed indicator, so a six-pack is normal. 
So you get airspeed indicator, altitude indicator, altitude indicator, vertical speed, compass, turn coordinator. Over here you've got the ADF gauge, which is quite interesting because the ADF is right on the other side of the cockpit. And here you've got the two nav instruments. So they're obviously one of them has glide slope, the other one doesn't. Um, you also get an RPM down here. And exhaust gas temperature is over there. The You can't operate the breakers, so that's a bit of a shame, but, you know, Carinado aircraft are not known for that extra level of realism. So we're just waiting for the GPS to align on us. Sit here at tick over. We'll put the flaps to take off position while we're waiting. Let's have a quick look actually, see how fast those flaps travel. So if we go full flaps, they're really quick aren't they? Okay, satellite's nearly there. So for our little test flight we are going to go from Boonville down to Cloverdale Municipal, so D83 to 060. So let's just go and quickly program that into the GPS. So D83 Boonville ends up and then click on there and 060 Cloverdale enter and that's our flight plan done. It's a very very simple flight plan. We can obviously increase the range so we can see it and we could change the display. Ah, because this is a smaller version of the Garmin, you don't actually get to see the arc mode. So this is the best we're going to get for a visual representation of where we are, which is fine. And to be honest, we're going to be hand flying anyway. So having GPS is kind of, it's a nice to have, but it's not essential. We will have a little play with the VORs along the way though. So let's get that tuned in. So we want 112.30 for the nearby masts, which is over here, look, 11230. So let's go 112.30 and switch that to active. So you should see, uh, yeah, that moved. Um, we can obviously turn the omni bearing selector. This is a bit more of a traditional nav instrument. It hasn't got the HSI that rotates around it. The compass is a separate instrument over here. So that's quite nice, I think, having the old-fashioned instruments. I like them. Uh, this is Nav 2 down here, so we could do the same on that just for a bit of fun. So we can go 112.30. Transfer that to active. That will burst into life. There we go. It's quite interesting that it's working at all, to be honest. Because, let me just tune it in. So it's that's telling us now the bearing basically to the the mast, which would be 35 degrees. Should we test that just to make sure? So if we were to measure from us to the mast, it's 48 degrees. So there's a bit of a mystery for you. If we press D, is it going to make any difference to it? No. Anyway, um, that's a bit that's interesting that those are so different. Oh, they are, no, they have moved, haven't they? Sorry, I misread them. 45 degrees. Let's have another look at that, just to confirm. Yeah, so... It's in the ballpark. Anyway, it's interesting, though, that we're getting any kind of signal, because there's a load of hills in the way. And if we look around us, there's no way it's going to do line of sight, but maybe we're just being lucky with the atmospheric conditions. Okay, let's go and take this for a fly, shall we, rather than talk endlessly about it. So, parking brake off. Centre the view up. Did I mention that the... Obviously all the things that you would expect to be moving in the cockpit work, which is quite nice. Got outside air temperature obviously up here. Hey, full throttle. So it's a lovely day. I'm not expecting to have any issues. You can see on the windsock there, it's just hanging. We're having to give it a small amount of right rudder to hold the center line. And then rotate. Let's have a look from outside at what that looks like. A 
flaps up. Bit more back stick to counteract the absence of the flaps. Come back, get back inside. Begin a turn. So it's holding about 90 knots in a climbing turn, which is not bad really. Obviously we have no autopilot, so not an issue anyway. So there's the airfield, just over here. Okay, so let's get some elevator trim going on to level the plane out. Just over a thousand feet. We didn't calibrate the altimeter. We're nowhere near a thousand feet. So we're just coming up to 1500 feet. So it's very, very stable. I think that's the main takeaway immediately. It's incredibly stable, but then the Piper Archer is known for being incredibly stable. So let's get a bit of altitude and en route to our destination. We will have a play. So you can see there we are on the little nav map travelling towards our track. We want to be flying about 114 degrees. Okay. So we need to just keep an eye on that on the compass. So 114 would be. So there's 120. So it's halfway between. Will be our track towards our destination. So while we're flying along. We'll get a little bit of altitude, we'll go to about 3,000 feet and then we'll do some stall tests en route. But so far it's remarkably straightforward. Obviously we can use the GPS as a reference as well to see if we're going the right direction. But it's nice to have a plane that's so hands-on. It did make me laugh when I first got in it and realised there was no autopilot and then I noticed that there's little paint left on the yokes and that's obviously because it has to be hand flown. You can't just engage the autopilot and let go. So your hands would naturally rest on the yoke rather than letting go of it. Okay, let's lean it out a little bit as we climb, coming up to 3,000 feet. So we're going to lean the mixture. Oh, the sim has just paused on us. It's been doing this a lot to me today. I already re-recorded the first few seconds of this earlier because within, just as I started talking, it froze. Hopefully it won't do it again now it's done it once. It doesn't tend to repeatedly do it. It's very odd. But yeah, the, the modelling of the textures is just stunning, isn't it? Can have a look around inside. We have to be careful, of course, because the aircraft is just flying along uncontrolled while I'm looking around inside. But it's just ridiculous, isn't it? They really have nailed it. it looks real. Okay, so we've got a little bit of altitude now. We've come up to 4,000 feet. Let's pull the throttle back. I try a stall. So we'll keep it straight. We're going to keep an eye on the attitude indicator here. Keep the marker in the middle. Keep pulling back on the throttle as we lose airspeed. So we've got no flaps. There comes the stall warning. Oh, it's trying to drop. Yes, it's dropped a wing. Interesting. I wondered w with the design of it whether it would fall in a straight line because it's got these kind of the wing shape is similar to some other aircraft that don't drop a wing, but it did. Okay, let's go full throttle then. Let's try a power on stall, see how it behaves. So we'll go for a much higher climb angle.
feeding in the back stick and it's it's controllable so it's still trying to drop a wing but unless you really force it it's not going to tumble and I don't believe you can spin it to be honest we could give it a go couldn't we so if we were to just out of interest put it into a turn a steep turn under power Can we force it to tumble? No, we can't. It won't do it. Just coming off the throttle so we don't overspeed. Now, the interesting thing now, having tumbled, is if we go back for the direction we wanted to be going, which was about 115, was it? Something like that. Now, has the compass deviated? Has the gyro compass deviated from the binnacle compass? If we press D and see it move, no, it didn't. I so that's probably not that realistic. You would have expected this compass during those manoeuvres to have deviated from the binnacle compass, and it didn't. Okay, let's go full throttle, and let's get to our destination and go and see how we get on. So we are, we've got the radio tuned in, so if we turn to 60 degrees, we should be able to intercept the VOR. We want to be flying in uh, 126 degrees to be on the radial, yeah? So if we go and tune this to 126, We'll see how we get on. So we're flying 65, 70 degrees at the moment. So you can see on the GPS we're, we're going to cut across to the track of where the, the VOR was. So let's have a look at our vertical speed. Let's get the plane level and, and fast. Let's see how fast it will go in a straight line. Just going to get trying to trim this out to get it to fly fairly level all on its own we're almost there we're lucky it's such a still day otherwise we'd be buffeted probably by wind from these hills you see the aircraft is rolling very very slowly right all the time we could counter that with some aileron trim I'm going to try not to I wonder if we can do some basic aerobatics with it while we're on our way. Should we try it? So let's put it into a slight dive, get it up to the limit for the cruising. The aileron, sorry, the elevators have become incredibly heavy in doing that. So let's try it. Just doing an aileron roll. We lost power as we did that. So I don't think it would stick being upside down for very long. I think if we had stayed upside down we would have lost the engine okay so we're looking here look at the um, the course deviation indicator is sweeping in on nav 1 meaning we're getting closer to our track so we will be turning right to to 125 degrees in a moment or 126 wasn't it okay so we'll begin turning So we are now on the 126 degree radial from, notice it says FR on the nav instrument, where in other words we're travelling away from the VOR. We don't have distance measuring equipment, but then we have got two radios. So if we did have another beacon, we could figure out where we were by triangulating and we don't really have another beacon we can use. That one might be too far away. So we have a look. The range on this one is only 40 miles. 
and we're about 60 70 miles away from it which is a shame it doesn't matter we can go visually along the valley here anyway we know the airfield is down here so we're going to swoop in and land when we lift our head up using the space bar it's kind of unfortunate that this is right in our way so I doubt with the seating position the way it is in this aircraft you really need it very much Should we have a look and see what's written on it? So it's the power setting for the engine. So given various heights, it's the amount of horsepower output you're going to get. And the fuel flow, so you can figure out your most efficient altitude for a route, which is quite useful. So we're deviating from our route here, look, we're off to the right of the radial. So we're going to go back past 120 degrees and centre it back up. Should we lower that altitude a little bit as well along the way? So we'll cut the throttle, nose down, I'm cruising back down. We're almost back onto the radial. turn right again. You can see the airstrip down here. So we'll just descend in all the way now. Do a left circuit and come in. I'll just check the wind at the airfield. So yeah it would support that so if we hover the mouse over it it tells us wind is variable three knots at ground level but in the air generally the wind is from the the northwest so that does work for us doing a left circuit in coming in at the far end visibility is really lovely and it's nice in a low wing aircraft that you can look out easily when you're turning so you get to see out over the top of the wing during the turn which makes you know approaching airfields that bit easier obviously it's tricycle undercarriage as well which makes it very very easy to handle on the ground okay so we're coming down to Cloverdale Should have a look outside Whoops, Sim has paused again. I wonder if this is to do with it running out of graphics RAM or something. I'll have to try running it at lower graphics levels to see if it affects it. I very much doubt it though because I've flown on group flights where it's had no issue. I wonder if it's connected to fetching the data from the servers sometimes. Who knows? I'll try turning the graphics level down soon and see if I still get the, the same pauses. No other software does it at all. Only Flight Sim. Okay, so we'll just circle around the back of these industrial units and come in for an approach. It's probably a farm actually, isn't it? Probably being very disingenuous calling it industrial units. Looks like it might be a, a very busy farm. How are we doing for speed? Still going quite fast. Speed's coming off. We're into the realm now where we can drop the flaps and we will do so. 50% flaps. So if we sit, or no, we can push over closer to the window to see the airfield. Okay. 
going for full flaps now. It's very, very stable, but then I'm, I've been lucky with the weather today, it's very still. But you can see, it's it goes exactly where I'm pointing it. It'll be interesting to see what it does when it flares over the runway. Just holding the nose up a little bit and bleeding some speed off. Just hold it high above the round. I think we're already down. Yeah, we are. That was remarkably smooth, wasn't it? Very, very easy to control. So it flaps up. And we'll taxi in. I am actually amazed at how easy that was to control. So obviously the um, landing lights can come off. It's very, very cool, isn't it? Oh, the Mustang's here again. He was here yesterday. Looks like there's a Cessna parked next to him today. Not sure which model of Cessna it is. Might be a... 17 or a 182, we'd have to get a good look at the nose, I guess, to figure it out. And um, we have a caravan, oh no, it's a Kodiak, sorry. Oh, it doesn't do your confidence any good, does it, when they have a fire engine waiting for you? Mr. Kodiak. Should we park up next to the Mustang? Okay, parking brake on. Pull the mixture up, cut the engine, turn the lights off, turn the pitot heat off, turn the alternators off, turn the master switch for the avionics off and turn the battery off and as against how we actually received the aircraft we will try see if we can turn the fuel around is it going to let us there we go very good okay so just out of interest yeah it's a 182 you can see that the bigger dip on the nose and that's the Cessna 515 that seems to have sunk into the tarmac. Interesting. Anyway, there we go. The Piper Archer 2, the PA-28 from Carinado in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Please like the channel, or like the video, sorry, and subscribe to the channel. If you click the bell icon at the top corner, apparently it tells you when I've put some new content out. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there, and I'll see you again soon.